great. So yeah, we can get started. Thank you very much everyone for being here. This is our event entitled The Future of Learning, where we're going to explore uh, different ways of experiencing the educational system and talking about the current way that we understand learning and the future of this idea as well. My name is Yasmin. I am part of the SI London Hub and uh, have my great um, uh, people here with me. We have Michael, Ben and Nina who are helping uh, me to co-host and co-facilitate this event that you have uh, today. So just a bit about the organizations that are uh, organizing this event. So we have Mutual Fruit um, that aims to unlock problems for countries, companies, and communities by reframing the essence of the problem without constraints, triggering fresh and collaborative ways to find powerful new solutions that work for all. And the SI London Hub uh, is a local hub of systems innovation network, a global community of people who learn and connect to apply systems thinking and systems innovation methods in tackling an array of complex challenges, including cities, energy, mobility, food, education, and so on. So before we get started, I would just like to remind you uh, about some details of this event. So this is gonna take 60 minutes. Uh, this is going to be an interactive session and you're more than welcome to use the chat to address any comments, any questions. Uh, we're going to be aware of the chat and pick them up during uh, our event today. And just please remind to be on mute so we can um, yeah, maintain the, um, the silence and don't have any interference in the sound but feel free to use the chat as much as you can, all right? And who are we? So we have Nina Jindal with us today. If you can just wave quickly, Nina, great. So she is the founder of Agency Me, and she enables individuals to find their food and to live it. We have Michael Rivers, little wave, Michael, great. So he's a future strategist, innovation performance engineer, and a founder of uh, Mutual Fruit. He orchestrates, shapes, and drives the development uh, of consistent um, investable proportions at teams, companies, consortiums, community, and country levels. We have Ben Attle. All right, Ben. Uh, he's a London Hub uh, extended team member trustee at Sierra Leone Education and Development Trust, interested in social innovation, education in developing uh, economies. And myself, Yasmin, I am an SI community developer, a part of the SI London Hub core team, uh, an educational psychologist, and my interests are in psychology, education, complexity science, and interdisciplinarity. And with us today, we have our guest speaker, uh, Raya Bicharhi, a uh, serial entrepreneur and award-winning educator, founder and CEO of School of Humanity, a breakthrough online high education, uh, re high school uh, reinventing education. So we thank you very much, Raya, for being here with us as well. And yeah, um, information about the agenda that we have for today. So we have four main, main sections here. First of all, we're going to spend a bit of time in the context of uh, the, the environment of our education. So we're going to touch upon these uh, subtopics here. The world is changing fast, change in the world are driving fundamental shifts in the world of work. Organizations and individuals must respond, the new forces of attraction and the corollary a paradigm shift is on the way from education to learning. Then we're going to spend some time talking about the challenge and the transition that we uh, would like to see in the education system. And finally, we're going to um, finish our session with the section of opportunity. The opportunity to reinvent learning and how might we reinvent schools as open learning facilities, an introduction to a project. 
So again, thank you very much everyone for being here and I'll pass it over to Michael, who is going to start our presentation. Sorry, Michael, you're on mute. Okay. Um, I think the starting point is to recognize that education is not um, just about learning for its own sake. Um, it's clear that skills and talent drive the attractiveness of economies and their growth. Um, if you look at these two recent reports by Ernst & Young about the attractiveness of the UK um, and uh, another report there, which you can pick up about um, skills for um, inward investment, you'll see that in Scotland, in Northern Ireland and in Wales, but not in England um, until perhaps the Labour Party arrive, um, is, the, is it clear that the availability of skills, the quality of skills, the depth of the talent pool are key attractors for economies? And we see that um, in, in places like South Africa, where corporates consider carefully the depth and quality of the talent pool in their inbound investments. I think we can move forward from there. So, Ben, over to you. Fantastic. Thank you, Michael. So I think we're all aware that the world is, is changing at a very fast pace. And we try to outline here four or some of the key drivers presently. So that's information technologies, innovation economies, changing values, as well as globalization. So on the information technologies part, we have a short video that we prepared beforehand that we'll quickly show you. It's roughly two minutes long, but it'll help you show just how fast the world is changing right now. Um, so if we move on to that, amazing. The World Economic Forum calls it the fourth industrial revolution, but what's happening is beyond industry. It is actually affecting the whole of society. In the 17th and 18th century, steam allowed us to industrialize production. Electricity arrived at the end of the 19th century. We used it to design new and scalable ways to produce things such as assembly lines. Information technologies and computing started in the 50s and 60s and reached fruition at the beginning of the 21st century. We're still feeling how much this third revolution changed our world. Now, in the fourth industrial revolution, it might seem that we are quite far into it, but we are still at the beginning. If you consider how much the world changed in each of the previous industrial revolutions, it's fair to assume there are big changes ahead. Around 20 technologies make up the fourth industrial revolution, all developing exponentially and also converging, all at the same time. Recall how Gutenberg's printing press completely changed how we disseminate knowledge. Now we have the equivalent of 20 simultaneous Gutenberg moments. Ray Kurzweil said we are about to experience 20,000 years of technological progress in just a hundred years. The agricultural revolution happened 10,000 years ago, so he is anticipating twice the total progress to date in only one century. Fantastic. So that kind of sets the context because the next 100 years, there's going to be rapid change. But why? So the video highlights partially those information technologies and specifically for education, how it previously worked was quite a one way stream of information going from a teacher or a person of authority towards the recipient in some way. But we know that information technologies are reducing the cost of how to disseminate information in a much more pervasive way than it has done before. So this increases the different possibilities for learning in a, in a much wider degree of context as well. Innovation economies is this shifting idea that we are not just having economies that are there to produce goods and services out of some scarce resources, but society's new goal, the economy's new goal is to try and increase the quality and value that we are generating through new business models and, and services. And this requires new ways of, of thinking and organizing or so. 
the third point changing values so with the sustainability crisis the living crisis this is causing people across the world to really rethink at a core level what are their their values and these challenges that we are addressing needs new solutions and new ways of thinking as well we have to come together to think more collaboratively so the different skills and competencies that we that we need and we need people to to think in different ways then find this point around globalization uh, with more and more people entering let's say a global middle class um, there is increased strain upon certain industries healthcare education that and often that means that the limited resources we have often get funneled towards an exclusive few so we're really facing that challenge of how can we make learning and education accessible to all but not just accessible making sure there is quality education that really is uh, disseminated those are some of the factors that are really driving that change but there's question marks about how that will look like in practice and that's what we're going to move on to now so michael and nina i'll pass back to you Michael, you are on mute again. I know, I know. Just looking for my share. Have you seen this? Hmm. Seem to have a problem with this. We can we can see the presentation, Michael. Oh, you can. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay, is that is that up now? Yes, it is. Great, thanks very much. So I, I wanted to talk about magnetism. And organisations really are magnets in the sense that they're very much inwardly directed and focused on attracting and keeping the people um, that they that they have. Um, and Ben talked about the fourth industrial revolution and, and the dislocation. And we all know that we need to adapt and change. And the question mark is uh, for individuals and organizations. The, the issue for organizations is that digital technologies require a change in mindset. They require a different kind of openness. They require a willingness to adapt. They need speed. Um, but more than that, when we look at the world of work and the changes in values and the appreciation of work, jobs need to be more than just a wage. They need to be flexible. They need to have purpose and they need to be more attractive to a very diverse talent pool that's now coming from all over the world. Um, the corollary for individuals is different. Um, individuals need to think of themselves in a very, very different way. They need to consider themselves as a value proposition. They need to continuously build that portfolio of credentials. And most importantly, they need to define and manage their own growth pathways with autonomy. So here's Adriana on the employment side. She took over her father's small metalwork business a couple of years ago, increasing production. She's developing some new products. But, you know, even though she doesn't look worried, she is because good people are in short supply and the people she needs don't see much of a future for themselves in a the small business. Her last decision went bad. She brought in the commercial director and actually it was a disaster, nearly cost her the business. 
and it took about six months of legal action to disengage. So um, Adriana is asking who the right people are to help us scale her business and, and what is it that she needs to offer them apart from money to attract them and how could she make sure that she doesn't get stuck again? So looking at the other side of the coin, here's Mark. He's been working at multinationals, but he wants a change. You know, it's important to have a challenge if he's still to grow. But many of the smaller companies he's looked at don't really offer a clear future, not for the company, not for themselves. And he's kind of concerned about getting stuck with a small team of people he finds difficult to work with. You know, should he really give it a go? Should he try something smaller or should he stick with a larger organization? Well, when you talk to John Clifton, who's the CEO of Gallup, it's kind of clear that this transactional employment model is no longer fit for purpose. So I give you money for time and attention uh, and you get out of it what I say you can get out of it. And John is saying what we really need to do in order to potentially save the world is change the way your people are managed. So what is the evidence for that? This is the state of global workplace 2023. It shows employee engagement by country. Uh, you can go online and you can scale it up and you can see on average that, you know, those who thrive at work are in the low 20s percentages. Those who are loudly quitting, who are sabotaging and actively disengaged or quiet quitting just doing their job are causing a 9% drag on global GDP. That is $8.8 trillion. OK, so what would it be like? What would the world be like if more people were engaged in their job? There is a direct link between engagement. And you're doing what you like and you're doing what you enjoy and you're doing a great job and you're excited where, whenever you wake up in the morning and the alarm rings. Uh, uh, so there needs to be a different way of looking at things. So how can we make both sides more attractive to each other? Well, what we need to do is to move to what we call a value transaction, okay? We, we need a common language to describe what is needed and what is offered that goes beyond the functional and technical requirements, which goes beyond track record and the company that you might have worked for or the size of the team that you've managed or how big your budget was or how many people, uh, how many people reported to you in how many locations. And this creates a kind of clarity as to the basis of attraction. Why, what is it that we actually need to achieve? Okay, and is this a, a, an opportunity, a bargain, a transaction, a deal that you want to engage in? And what, what is it that you're bringing as an individual? Okay, and this provides some kind of new transparency as to the promises that we make to each other, employee and or individual and organization, including commitments to growth. So if I work for you and I deliver this outcome, what is it that you will do to help me grow my value or keep sustainable in the world of work? So as the ancient philosopher said, the starting point is to know thyself. And this is really still true. And knowing thyself integrates three dimensions. Knowing, knowing is beyond functional, it's beyond technical. It's the 47 skills as we'll, as we'll outline in just a second. Uh, your being is your motivations and your attitudes. And, and one thing is it, which is not picked up is your doing. To codify your natural way of creating, of making decisions, of solving problems. You know? This is very hard to do. But if you can express this as what we call a personal success map, this helps you to articulate your uniqueness and strengths and show and find value in all areas of your life, including most importantly, ways to participate more effectively in the fast changing world of work. Back to you guys. In fact, back to me. So um, if we continue there, um, we had a very interesting session uh, a little while back from Dr. Pavel Luksha. Um, who is a very leading education futurist. He works uh, at the Global Education Futures Initiative. And this is really about catalyzing the transformation of educational ecosystems at global scale. And um, Pavel asked a very interesting question. He didn't start with the technicalities and the status quo of education. He asked a different question. 
He said, how is it that we can respond to the complexity of those social technical systems that Ben was alluding to? And how can we deal with the rise of these VUCA landscapes? So the question is really, you know, do we do something different? Yeah. Or do we stay where we are? And the fundamental question is, how is it that we can make the world work better for all of the population? And how is it that we can do that in a way which benefits the planet, that restores and sustains? Uh, and the next question that, uh, that um, uh, uh, Pavel went on to ask is really the question about why are we learning? Why are we learning? Before, the reason for learning was to you know, support the industrial machine to produce people for the military, um, to reproduce existing society. But, but, the, but the premise now is that what it is that we need to learn for is to enable all to thrive, to produce a new form of society. And, and the premise is that existing education factories, and they are monolithic, uh, and I'm sure Rai will have a few more words to say about that later, uh, they do not prepare society to cope with the 21st century. They, they are incapable of adaptation because of the way that they are formed and because of the weight uh, of, of, of their tradition. They do not, they continue to invest in processes and, and models that are industrial. Um, they, 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 push, um, they push education in a particular form um, and, they, and the uh, emphasis is on ways of knowing that are not useful in the future. So, what Pavel says is we need to move from an industrial society and beyond a knowledge-based economy to a society that is based on wisdom. Uh, and in doing that, he pointed out that the, the let's say, the latency on the, the durability of the skills that we needed. Okay, So context skills and domain-specific skills are relatively easy to acquire. And generalists such as, my, as myself, you know, deal in cross-context domains, the ability to leverage one domain into another. But beyond that, you know, we need to think at a meta level and an existential level. And, and the value in learning those things is that the lifetime of those skills persists. Okay. Yeah, there's a table on the right hand side that I'm not proposing to go into, but some of those some of those human skills um, which are set out in that table social and emotional intelligence media literacy mindfulness economic intelligence creativity collaboration and metacognition the ability to know how to learn is a learned thing okay so what pavel envisages is a transition from the from a a, a an episodic um, education model where education effectively ends when you come out of the university gate um, and tails off um, into a model where education and learning is for all. But more than this, the most important thing is that there's a synergy between the trajectory of personal learning, your own goal setting and learning outcomes that help you grow as an individual and collective learning, what we as a society need to learn and understand and apply in order to uh, in order to grow um, a, a, as a society. Now, uh, thinking a little bit further towards the, the right hand side, thanks, Yasmin. Um, what we're really thinking about is self-guided learners. Yeah. How can we enable learning uh, to be uh, accessible and available and, and actionable for all? How can we enable learners to develop their own pathways? How can we connect individuals? How can we connect platforms locally and globally to enable that learning to take place? Um, on the right hand side, you'll just see um, Pavel's very, very interesting report. I think it's uh, uh, a few years old, but definitely worth a long, long read. So there we go. Great, thank you, Michael. Yeah, indeed, uh, though that uh, report is very worth reading and definitely we're going to put the references afterwards um, in the chat. So as you could uh, identify uh, so far, we are embedded in a very, very uh, 
complex system, right? When we talk about education, we are not just talking about um, the, the institutions, right? We're talking about several other systems that are embedded in the challenges that we face when we talk about why we learn and try to reframe what are the what is the purpose of our uh, learning and education system and, and this is a very important uh, distinction to to make when trying to understand the the nature of the challenges that we're facing and here i will bring you this idea of uh wicked problems or wicked challenges uh have you heard of this terminology before if you would like to put on a chat or just nod your head maybe yes maybe no let me see some let me see yes yes great awesome so we have a lot of people there familiar with this idea very very good so as you probably know uh these ones uh, are very, the nature of these challenges are very different from what we call the tame problems or the simple problems that we have out there. For example, the light bulb on your uh, house is not working or you have a puncture on your car and so on. Um, these are, uh, in the grand scheme of things, these are very easy co uh, cause, uh, consequence type of problems that we face on our everyday life. However, when we talk about wicked problems, those have a very different feature to it. So for example, there's no uh, fixed solution. So in, the ter in terms of the education system, how do you um, fix the problem of uh, students not having jobs after they go through higher education, for example? There's no fixed solution to it. Those wicked challenges are very multidimensional. So as uh, this very good graphic shows here, it's not just about one specific system being um, the, the cause of that specific challenge. It's about the interrelationship of several elements, several factors from different fields and different dimensions. They're actually um, enabling the emergence of these problems that we that we call the wicked problems. Uh, there are very conflicting opinions on how we can go about uh, tackling those challenges. So it's not just you have a manuals guide and then you fix it and then you follow it and then you fix the problem. There are very different ways to really understand how to uh, face the situation. And then of course, achieving a specific outcome out of it. And lastly, they're highly dynamic and open-ended. So there is no specific end to it. There is no specific uh, pathways forward. It's just all these different elements are very, very dynamic and uh, embedding their, um, embedding into, that makes the these wicked challenges uh, a lot more uh, complex to actually, be understood and then of course uh, to go about tackling them and I'm not going to uh, spend too much time here because um, I'm sure Rai is going to share some of this uh, I, of this idea as well but for for the ones that would like to know a, a bit more about this iceberg model this is a very good way to start shifting our perspective in understanding the, the nature and the deep rooted um, causes of these wicked challenges, right? And here in the iceberg model, we have uh, four main levels. The events is normally the levels that we can uh, see the problem. So if there are um, people that can't get to the end of the, the, the program uh, in the school, this is something that you can actually see. Uh, these are observable phenomena. Then underneath uh, this level, you have the trends. So you, one might question, uh, how are things changing over time? Or what are the trends? They're actually 
uh, underneath these observable phenomena that we can actually witness on our everyday life. So here you can start thinking deeper about, about the problem, just seeing the tip of the iceberg, right? Below, we can uh, have the, the structures level. So what are the underlying power structures, for example, that are enabling the, the sustainability, let's say, or the prevalence of these events over here? Are there rules and policies that are actually supporting the existence of these events? And lastly, the mental models or the, the thinking, the beliefs. What are the mental models that are supporting these systems? So we can uh, see the reoccurrence of these events over and over through maybe generations. So this is a very, very useful model for us to start deepening our understanding of these wicked challenges. And then through this understanding, we can have uh, better ways to move forwards with our um, activities and tackling them. So this is the, the question. This is how we started actually uh, an education challenge um, with the SI London Hub that gave rise to this report here that you're going to have the, the references afterwards. But essentially, we brought people together to start thinking about the different levels that are embedded in this, uh, in the education. And we started understanding that, as uh, Ben and uh, Michael mentioned before, there are very complex challenges that are embedded into uh, what we call the education system. So for example, the technological revolution, uh, as been mentioned before, social imbalance or inequality, exponential rate of growth. These are just some of the social challenges that we can see are influencing the state of the education um, that we have at the moment, right? And once we started uh, digging deeper into why is that, what are the, the main features that we can understand uh, from the, the challenges that we see at the moment. And here we've identified five main, uh, let's say features of this education challenge, of, this, of the education system, right? So uh, highly centralized, so, lack of connection between disciplines and schools and universities. So as we've probably witnessed, um, it's very difficult to have an understanding on how the different disciplines that we learn actually connect and have some resonance within the, within the education and amongst themselves, right? Uh, aesthetic. So in the 21st century, we have uh, a very large uh, resources of information and technology and so on, but our education system is still um, in the 18th century uh, structure, let's say. So how, how is it possible that we can tackle the challenges uh, in the 21st century with a very old mindset? Individual learning, very difficult for you to um, have contact with more people and share ideas and uh, create projects together and so on. It's just very um, individual orientated. Then we have institutional, in, institution centered. So as we've probably witnessed as well, uh, schools and universities and um, let's say official buildings are the, the places to learn. Every, everywhere else it's uh, extra. So the official places to learn are in these institutions. And finally, highly standardized. So no acknowledgement for diversity and context and background. Uh, everyone goes through the same process and that's, that's it, right? So these are the main challenges that we've identified um, with the, the cohort that participated with us. They, these offer very important opportunities as well for us to look at the future and see where are the, the windows of opportunity, let's say, so we can uh, craft a better system moving forward. 
And essentially, we've collectively uh, thought about what would the future look like if we didn't have these main features. And then from each one of these five features, we've, um, we've collected, for example, instead of centralized, we have ecosystems. It's not just uh, one specific subject very separate to each other, but you have ecosystems that are actually um, supporting each other. They are um, creating synergies between um, disciplines and different methodologies and so on. So for aesthetic, we have uh, for the future, active and continuous learning. So it doesn't stop when the, the building finishes, right? It a continuous learning experience that you have not just in the institutions, but outside within your family, your study group, uh, your peers in different uh, spaces. Uh, what would be the opposite or the way individual learning? Then we have collective learning. So not just you doing your essay and giving and receiving your own grade, but this is a very um, extended way of uh, learning and experiencing the education that we uh, would like to see. Um, for institution-centered, why not learner-centered? Acknowledging the individuality of each one, each, um, each one of us that is uh, a lot more important than the, the grades that we receive. And finally, instead of in st uh, standardized, we have unconventional ways of learning. So not just essays and uh, grades, but we have different ways of assessing what a good education looks like. And with this discussion that took um, a few months, um, Michael and, and Ben and Nina were participating in the discussion with us as well. Uh, we've identified some of the main ideas that we would like to see in the future. And they are all embedded here. I won't go into details here as well. Um, but this is to show that people are aware and people really want a different type of education, a different way of experiencing learning. And we have the resources and the capabilities of doing so. So uh, events like this one, and of course, uh, projects such as um, the School of Humanity and others are very good ways for us to rethink how do we understand education, how do we understand learning, and what is the future of it. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, we have the, the full resource here for you to have a, a sense on how we can go from these challenges and opportunities to the future of education. Uh, we're going to leave that in the resources as well. And I think that was uh, a very good insight to have with the cohort. So um, yeah, I would like to, to hear more from you as well. What do you think about that? So now I'll pass it over to Raya so she can explain a bit more about uh, reinventing schools. Thank you. Amazing, thank you so much. Um, and education is one of those wicked problems. And I think you're doing an amazing job right now, synthesizing the crux of the issue in less than an hour. So uh, it's been really interesting to see, see your framing. So um, hi everyone. Um, I, I'm Raya, I'm the founder and CEO of School of Humanity. Uh, I've been asked to speak about our school and really share it as a case study of how we can reinvent schools and practically speaking how we can do so. So I have a few slides. I'm conscious of time, so I try, I'll do my best not to take more than 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, let me just share my screen. Okay. Um, Okay, so just a quick introduction to School of Humanity. We are in now award-winning online high school that's reinventing education. At our school, our learners learn by tackling real-world challenges, 
Uh, we created our own curriculum that's focused on uh, the knowledge, skills, mindsets learners need for the future. And we're a global high school. We have learners calling into the online sessions from 16 different countries across five continents and a range of socioeconomic backgrounds. And um, one of the reasons, um, you know, one of the main reasons my team and I decided to uh, find or start School of Humanity was really out of our own pains with the education system as it exists. Despite the so-called diversity of curriculum and learning models, really most of us are actually going through a very similar schooling system, regardless of where in the world we are. And some of the frustrations I think have already been summarized. You know, we feel like exams are not measuring our potential. Age is not always an indicator of progress. Um, standardization of the curriculum means that many learners are losing their curiosity. And because we've already spent a lot of time on the problem, I'm going to skim over it. I think by now we should we can all align that there are several layers of issues with what we're learning in schools, how we're learning in schools, and as well as access to quality education. So I think the big trend that we uh, need to see in the education system is this shift away from the age of standardization towards the age of personalization, which is actually synergistic to other shifts we're seeing in our world. If you look at whether it's media or consumption of movies or music, we have AI algorithms now personalizing all of that to us. Even in things like medicine, we're seeing the rise of personalized medicine based on our genome and our background. So why shouldn't we have personalized education uh, based on our interests, goals, and many more. Now, the exercise I like to take people through is um, what if we started from scratch? So if we think about the practicalities of reinventing education, uh, there's a thought experiment I like to take people through, which is imagine for a second that our schooling systems, ministries of education, examination boards where you lived, imagine they disappeared. They were all wiped out. And we got to build something new from scratch. You got to build a new curriculum for humanity, uh, a new model of learning. How would you design our education system in such a case? Would you still have schools? Would you still have the curriculum as it exists? Would you have exams? You know, so the reason I do this exercise is because oftentimes to change a system, it's easier to create a new one than it is to create, uh, than, than to tweak the existing system. So what I'm gonna do is the next few minutes is take us through this journey of reinventing education. So let's start with the curriculum. Let's start with reimagining what we learn in this new education system. Now, in order to reinvent the curriculum in this new system that we're all creating together, we first need to ask ourselves, what is the goal of this curriculum? The goal of this curriculum isn't to prepare students for universities. It isn't even necessarily about the workforce exclusively, but rather, I think most people agree that education is a tool for human progress. So what we learn in school needs to be aligned with this goal. And of course, human progress is also about preparing learners for the emerging industries, enabling learners to live a life of human flourishing, uh, preparing for future readiness, but it all comes down to pushing humanity forward as a species. So for us at School of Humanity, our curriculum, we decided not to adopt A-levels, IB, or any of the existing standardized curriculum based on exams. We created our own literacy-based curriculum uh, based on the OECD definition of literacy, which is a combination of knowledge, skills, and mindset. So in order to be financially literate, you might have knowledge in finance, sort of mindsets in finance, towards financial literacy, towards beha behaviors, as, to, as well as towards sk certain skills towards financial literacy. That's just one example. And in this human literacy curriculum, we have different credit areas that we cover. And as you can see, yes, the science and the math and the quantitative skills are still covered, but we've brought in many significant things that have traditionally been extracurricular into the core. So things like existential intelligence, things like action, which was touched on earlier. For us, these are not on the sidelines. They're at the very core of the curriculum and as important as anything else. And um, Michael touched on earlier the importance of these soft skills. Once again, it's crucial to include these into the core curriculum of high school. So we have an aspect of our model called the human flourishing curriculum. Every learner participates in weekly workshops, as well as a personalized flourishing journey, which focuses on these things. Things like finding purpose and meaning, things like mindfulness and meditation, things like consciousness and the self. And um, these are these are crucial 
uh, skills for us to have. So we have our curriculum in this new education system. Now let's ask ourselves, how would we design how we learn in schools? How, how would we design the learning journey towards these outcomes of these literacies that we've identified together? So we know that fundamentally um, that learners learn best by following their curiosity. We know that we're incentivized to learn more when we can see the practical applications of what we're learning. We also know that we all have different journeys. Some of us learn best through using our hands. Some of us uh, learn best through speaking and socializing and learning in groups. And there's this need for personalized path the mastery of learning target. So starting with these first principles, we then, um, uh, for us as a team, decided to adopt uh, something called challenge-based learning. So every term uh, in our high school, our learners participate in challenges instead of just say traditional knowledge-based courses. Examples of some of the challenges we've run include future of internet media democracy, food, energy, water security, our common humanity, and much more. Uh, the first half of these challenges are educator-led. We guide learners through an interdisciplinary analysis of a challenge. The second half is more learner-led, where they then start to drill down into a problem they want to tackle underneath the challenge and learn through projects, learn through uh, problem solving. So this is generally the trajectory of a term, of a challenge. Uh, for our learners, they start with the engage phase, then they go into investigating sub challenges, then they act on a challenge. This is deliberately not solved, they're not expected to solve. The idea is to act and actually learn through the lens of the challenge. We added two extra phases to this pedagogy. One was a micro internship or an opportunity to apply it in a real world context. So we bring in pioneering organizations to um, uh, offer a micro internship themed to the challenge. And we always end with one of our favorite rituals, which is a showcase at the end of the term. So challenge-based learning by nature is interdisciplinary, which connects with the holistic approach you were talking about earlier. So to use an example in the designing space habitat challenge, some of these are some of the modules and focus areas. We look at space chemistry, the chemistry of space environment. We learn anatomy and physiology by looking at the impact of space, other living on other planets on the human body. Uh, we learn physics to so looking at rocket propulsion. So you're still learning these subjects just in a much more interdisciplinary way. Another example is our unit on designing with nature, where we learn biology by looking at how systems work in our natural world. Uh, we look at geometry by looking at how nature uses shape to accomplish its goals. And again, you're still learning those key subjects. You're just learning them in a much more interdisciplinary way. I'll share a few other snippets uh, before wrapping it up a little bit early so that we have time for the closing. Uh, one other pedagogy that has informed our philosophy and teaching learning philosophy is this idea of mastery-based learning. So in a mastery-based learning model, you don't expect everyone to move through the same lessons at the same pace. Instead, you set outcomes and then leave room for personalization and how learners get there. So to illustrate this visually in a traditional, let's say, educator-led course, an educator would scaffold things into lessons and the class is expected to all move together uh, through, through each lesson. In a mastery-based approach, you flip it. It's learner-led. You have specific learning outcomes or standards of learning you want learners to meet and they only move to the next, next outcome if they've mastered the previous one, right? And learners are on their own personalized learning journey and you might form clusters of where they are in this journey. So a mastery-based classroom looks very different than um, a, a, a traditional one. Um, I think what I'm gonna do is maybe talk a little bit about how we evidence learning. Uh, yeah, so one of the ways we've also reinvented education in the system is rethinking how we evidence learning. So we don't have exams in our school. Uh, instead, we uh, evidence whether learning has happened through a range of formative and micro assessments that are often project-based and they're evaluated against objective rubrics that are consistent for all learners. So you bring in that rigor and objectivity, but you have more real world application-based um, 
evidencing of learning. And this really allows you to see whether learners can apply what they've learned in a real world context. How do you then um, reimagine the report card in such a context? So we adopted something called a mastery transcript. The mastery transcript is a portfolio-based transcript where you show all of the learner's projects and solutions and tag, tag these um, to uh, specific credit areas. A, not, a final dimension, a two dimensions I'll share for you to think about. One is reimagining re 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 where we learn. So thinking about the campus environment. Traditionally, we've thought schools are the place for learning. But one thing for us to think about as a provocation is decoupling the role of school from education. Schools for many students are, are a play a role of socialization. They play the role of adult guidance, of coaching, of mentorship and guidance. So it could be that you have an online first model with in-person support augmenting uh, the experience. And uh, of course, in, in the midst of all of this, we need to reimagine the role of the educator. Our educators aren't just transferring information. Instead, in all in this context, they're learning facilitators, they're learning journey designers, they're learning administrators or uh, industry mentors. And at our school, each of these are different roles. Rather than having one teacher do all of the above, we have industry mentors, we have learning designers, and, and, and so forth. Um, the last thing I'll leave you with, and I'm happy to go deeper into any of these if we have time, is uh, this quote from the futurist uh, Buck Minister Fuller. He says, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing one obsolete. It's one of my favorite frameworks and uh, approaches or strategies to changing the education system. It's about not changing it, but rather focusing on creating an alternative one that will inspire the current one to change. So yeah, happy to go deeper if we have time into any of these areas. I'll pass back to Michael and Yasmin now. Well, thank you very much for that deep, deep practical exploration. I'm sure I'm not the only one that would like to go back to school and wind the clock back a few years um, to uh, to participate in this wonderful school. I saw uh, Kim S's uh, comment about the magic wand and if only she could do that as well. And I think many people feel the same. So, so we've talked a lot about the frame and we've talked a lot about some of the theory. Um, and it's very interesting to hear how you started with high schools. And, and I understand from our conversation that you're looking at uh, uh, learning hubs, and, and indeed there's one in Bristol that's that's in um, in in progress. But um, let me just um, share a couple of slides, if I can make that happen, um, to um, to introduce a, a project that we'd like to do um, here in the wonderful borough of Hammersmith. Now I'm just trying to find my slides. Where are we? Sharing the screen. Yeah. Let me do that. Okay. Okay. So what we'd like to do is to um is to do this for real, uh, in a location near to you, and um, and let's think about the future of learning. Um, and here's the challenge that we want to set ourselves: How might we make learning more accessible, affordable, and accelerated? particularly for all those who need to keep themselves attractive in the fast changing world of work. So this is not about first learners uh, as, as what you're dealing with um, uh, focused on principally, but returning learners and continuing learners, people who need to upskill, people who need to reskill, um, particularly um, to make themselves attractive. And, and let's think about that in a different way. Um, what you see behind you is a school that happens to be behind our house. Um, it's been there since about the 50s. You can see it's been built uh, in a kind of a modular way. Um, it's moribund. It needs redevelopment. Um, but the proposal is to is to rebuild it almost exactly as it is at the moment. Um, and so what is intended is a primary school that's static and it's dedicated and it's exclusive to a relatively small number of people. And that is a very wasteful asset. I mean, the school is used about 15% of the year. I mean, your car, if you live in the city, is probably used about 5% of the time. So let's say in terms of hours of learning, it's extremely expensive. What we have in mind is to make it an open learning facility in the rebuilding, to make it more dynamic and flexible, to make it more inclusive, to make it more cost effective. And, and that will serve 
as a as a learning facility. Okay, it will have the the primary school students as the preferred customer, and and this is a vehicle that we see will inspire um other ways, other 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 units, other hubs, and that will develop the 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 quality and the depth of the talent pool as I alluded to at the beginning. So this is a an instrument of socioeconomic development. There may be some other ways to make use of the of the of the, of the area of the school and um, to to for uh, revenue generating uses. And if there's a shortfall between what we need and what we uh, uh, what we have, then there might be some very constructive and interesting ways to fund the gap. Um, this was a model that we developed uh, that through talking uh, through people around the world, including people at Melbourne and all of those places that are doing advanced work. And, and we can see that the opportunity is to build a different form of wealth for the community, to fulfill the per educational promise or purpose of the school, to open learning up to more people, to make it more attractive uh, uh, for the borough, uh, to make the borough more attractive, and potentially as a contribution to towards the industrial and economic strategy of this small economy of 180,000 people. That is the value for uh, the various uh, stakeholders. So the way that we propose to do that, we will draw on sprint based approaches, and I don't want to go into that in too much detail, but you can see there that there are a number of streams, learning, independent operator, complementary uses and viability. So let me skip through what that looks like. So our purpose in this project is to co-design sustainable ways, and when we say sustainable, that means balancing profit, people and planet, and make it more accessible, affordable, and accelerated for all citizens to learn. And that will build advantage for the economy called Hammersmith. So the scope of this is really in the learning. How can we bring these learners to a process and a context and a way of learning that leverages on all of that kind of great thinking that you're doing at the School of Humanity in terms of learning journeys and how we learn and how we learn together and how with the modality of the learning and how we evidence the skills that we have and how we build the skills that we need for our own particular path, including in the world of work. Okay? How might we manage that operation, that learning hub uh, in a different way? Let, let, it, let it not be the school and the headmaster that looks after the facilities. Let it be somebody that is charged with monetizing that asset in a useful way. Okay? And, and what is it that we could do on that site that is quite large that could complement the learning and could, could deliver economic value and, and funding. And how do we bring all of this together in a way which is sound and sustainable and acceptable and a better way to do it than to knock down the school and to rebuild it? So here's a practical project with a real context. So how could you be involved? Well, first of all, we need sponsors. We need people who can deliver resources in terms of funding or know-how and services, or can advocate for this particular project in terms of endorsing it, supporting it, connecting us into people that would, that, that would, that, that would allow it to thrive and to promote it. Secondly, in terms of support to the project, advisors, domain, uh, technology and finance, and evaluators of the propositions as they come through. But most of all, most of all, we need explorers, we need doers who are going to spend a certain amount of time. And, and, and if you'd like to register your interest, there's a little form here, there's a QR code, and there's a link on the, um, on the Miro board that you can pick up. Um, and that will ask you some questions about what's your motivation and where are you coming from and how much time could you commit and what do you think you could get out of it? So thank you very much for listening. Um, and I hope this has been an exciting, uh, challenge for you uh, to practice the thinking that you've been listening to this afternoon. Great, thank you everyone. I think Yasmin had to jump off to another meeting, so we're going to close the Zoom now. We popped in the link to the to the form that Michael was mentioning then. We'll try and follow up with everyone with kind of like the links that we shared throughout the session. Most likely we'll put the recording on our YouTube as well. But thanks everyone. I hope you have a great evening and thanks for coming today. It's been great. Thanks all. Yes. Bye-bye for now. Bye everyone. Bye-bye.